Hi, everyone. It is truly an honor to be on the stage with John. It's uh, our careers crisscrossed at NBC News. Um, so thank you for having me this morning. Um, I want to talk about, since the session is unraveling, my view as a physician. And what I'm going to say today, not everyone in this room is going to agree with, and that's OK. Today, I want to give you a sort of first person belief in where we are, where we're going, what's wrong, and frankly, how I see the world. And I can't tell you how I see the world if I don't bring with it every single bias that there is. So let me start by telling you that I am consumed by death and dying. That's all I think about. I turned 60 a year and a half ago, and so I am in the third third of my life. So I keep thinking, what am I going to do of significance in the third third of my life? I mean, the first part of my life really was dedicated to being a physician, even though I still describe myself as a physician. But I grew up in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I'm the daughter of an ear, nose, and throat physician. I'm the granddaughter of a neurologist. I knew since third grade I would be a doctor. So there were never any decisions to be made. When people said, well, what's next? It's, well, there's more school. Well, then what's next? Well, then there's my residency. Well, then what's next? Well, there's an academic appointment. So life was very much like this. And I remember when someone said to me in, in college, I went to Indiana University, well, what happens if you don't get into medical school? And I said, well, what do you mean? They said, well, you know, not everybody gets in. I was like, seriously? So there was this aha moment where then I drove to Indianapolis to interview with Eli Lilly to be a microbiologist as my plan B, since I didn't, haven't gone through life with many plan Bs, which explains a lot. And um, got my job as a microbiologist and then got into medicine and went, and went on. And then I had this accidental interaction with a film crew during my residency. I did pediatrics first, and then I did ear, nose, and throat surgery at the University of Pittsburgh. And I was doing a tonsillectomy at the University of Pittsburgh, and uh, a television crew came in and asked you know, some questions about tonsils, and I ended up talking. And the television crew said, you know, you're not bad. Have you ever considered doing television? And the answer was obviously no. And accidental things happened. I went to the University of Arkansas for my first real academic job, started doing television, and went to work for ABC News for 17 years as a correspondent for um, primarily Good Morning America and World News Tonight. So those were the two third thirds of my life. And I've been able to keep those lives on these parallel tracks when they interact when I've sort of deemed them so. And it's worked well because I always had a West Coast life. I was on staff at UC San Francisco for a gazillion years, while my television life, my broadcasting life, was primarily East Coast centered. So I always saw myself as a physician first, then a broadcaster, but there are times when those lives really became intimately related. But I always saw myself as a doc first. And now I'm 60, I'm 61, and I stepped out of the operating room last year because I think doctors, and particularly surgeons, are very bad at knowing when it's time to step back and change one's course. So I now teach young medical students and young surgeons how to be human beings, which is a much harder job than cutting people open. But that's my job at the University of Pennsylvania. But the reason I set those stories up is to tell you this idea of how I've seen medicine transform itself from the 50s in Indiana, where my father would accept barter from the local farm or an Afghan from a local woman who would make it in lieu of payment. My father would never have expected somebody to lose their house over the fact they couldn't pay a surgical bill. If a farmer had to pay $50 a month forever, or my father forgave a bill, that's what people did. My father never charged another physician to be seen. He never charged a nurse. He just considered that's the way it was. And somehow I know, when we all look back through our childhoods, it's easy to look at them through rose-colored glasses and think, think, weren't things sweeter then? 
but somehow there was a fee for service that was sweeter then before it started running out of control. And we all know the things that happened since. So in my lifetime as a young American girl, I've seen people walk on the moon. I've seen antibiotics become embraced to the point that everybody wants them even when they don't need them. My little brother had polio, and I remember lining up in the high school cafeteria um, when parental consent was an afterthought and everybody got their sugar cube and everybody got their shot and everybody got inoculated and everybody got sent home. And we worried as much about our communities as we did about ourselves. And then things started to happen. And I think medicine became a reflection of what was happening in our communities and nationwide. And that is, we started to think about me. But what about me? Not necessarily about my neighbor, but what about me? And then privacy became an issue. And then single rights became an issue, not necessarily community responsibility. And when I realized we were at a tipping point was when I was a young staff doctor at the University of California, San Francisco, and my job was at San Francisco General Hospital, one of the great hospitals in the world, where if you want to see any kind of disease from anywhere around the world, all you need to do is spend some time at San Francisco General. But I was at the General in the early 80s when HIV went from this little report of 12 gay men with skin cancers that nobody could quite understand to, oh my God, there's a problem with Haitians, to, oh my God, there's something we don't understand, to an acknowledgment and a, and a scientific discovery that there was a virus, that not through incidental contact, but through the exchange of bodily fluids was now killing people. And I was in San Francisco as this swath was cut through primarily the gay population. I attended a lot of funerals. I watched how gay men plan funerals. I learned about the celebration of life and not death. But I also learned something about physicians. And that is, when there's a fire, physicians don't necessarily run in. Now, I want to know we don't want to believe that, but here's what I saw. And it was a product of our time. HIV was not only not well understood, it was frightening. There's no cure, you're going to get it, and we didn't really know until, it's certainly in the early 80s, how it was transmitted. So when every patient started coming into the ER, especially those for whom there was blood splatter, and at San Francisco General there was a lot of blood splatter a lot of times, we suited up. We put on suits that were fluid impermeable, gloves, boots, hats, and masks. We looked like we belonged in outer space. And then we would touch people. And I believe that as a physician, in that moment, the physician separated him and herself from the patient population. Because what's one of the most important things that can happen between any two human beings, whether they be lovers, friends, casual acquaintances, or doctor patient or doctor nurse? We touch each other. We shake hands. Skin to skin contact is how we communicate. And certainly, if we look at the cultures of healing around the world, it's that human contact that elevates us. We know we can lower people's heart rates. We know we can make people feel good. We know we can give people better deaths, but just by holding each other's hands. But because of HIV, we ushered in the patient as vector of illness. And in so doing, we separated ourselves. I would see PR um, people from our, the public relations um, unit of the hospital take their skirts, open up doorknobs like this, and then let people in, even after we knew how HIV was transmitted. But that virus, more than tuberculosis, 
more than even polio, when we didn't understand what was going on in the 50s and 60s, transformed medicine and separated us from us and them. And I would argue that we haven't recovered. I would argue that we know a lot more about illness now than we've ever known before. But the glove situation continues. Now, I mentioned that I'm on faculty at University of Pennsylvania, and one of my jobs is to teach young surgeons how to be human beings. For those of you who have been patients recently, I'll bet that one of the first things that a physician did before touching you was to put on a pair of gloves, and then you get touched. There is no reason why latex needs to separate one human being from another. Latex has very important qualities of separating the patient from the disease-carrying physician and nurse, as well as the patient, as well as the physician who doesn't want to get hurt from the disease-carrying patient. But those gloves are meant for procedures or putting fingers in orifices. They aren't meant to separate us. There are enough ways with alcohol wipes at every station, every hospital, to wipe down our hands and then touch each other. But that need to go back to the basics is so important. We can talk about HIPAA, we can talk about technology, which will continue to go leaps and bounds ahead of us and all the conversations that we have to have about humanity. But we have to get back to the basics. So if we're going to talk about unraveling, one of the first things we need to do is talk about reweaving the relationship between patient and everyone else who is around him or her. Two years ago, two and a half years ago, my parents, my mom's now 86 and my father's 90, um, went to get their shingle shots. My mother got hers. And my father, and you have to remember, he's a surgeon, so there's a certain amount of arrogance that goes with it. My father was pissed off that Medicare wouldn't cover a shingle shot, so he didn't get it. He just thought, damn it, it's my, their responsibility to cover it, and they should cover it, and though I'm not going to get it. So guess what happened? My father got shingles. My father got shingles that affected one side of his head. He got meningitis, encephalitis, went into a coma, went into that semi-permeable membrane of death where he saw people that no one else saw, had lucid conversations with people in German and Yiddish with people who weren't there. He was a layer of a membrane from leaving this earth. And I whispered in his ear, because we've been very frank in our conversations about death and dying, Daddy, if you want to die, it's okay. And he said, as lucidly as he could, damn it, I'm too young to die. At which point I said, well, then get well. And he sat up and said, okay, okay. And it was over. And he came back from whatever was pulling him. And then from that point, went back into a coma for a couple of months, but went from a coma to a wheelchair, to walking with a cane, to now walking two and a half miles a day, reading the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal every day, and he knows exactly what's going on in Syria and the, and the markets, and he can talk to you about everything. But what got him into trouble was his unraveling that it was all about himself. And that vaccinations, which I believe hearken into sort of the new American scientific edge of illiteracy, his undoing almost became it's all about me. Now you could argue that everything I've just told you happens to be that the patient gets to say it's all about me, it's all about me, and that we have to be patient-centric. And I would argue that that's true as long as the doctor and nurse and family honor it. But it's not okay when it's all about you and you sacrifice those around you. So here's a scientifically literate physician who on the stance of a $200 bill refused to get a shot and in so doing 
took his wife down a very perilous path, hurt his family, and um, hurt himself the most. Which brings me back to one thing I want to talk about as we talk about the unraveling. For those of you who have ever seen me speak on air, and I recognize that I'm in a part of the country where this is not always a popular statement, I am an unabashed believer in vaccines. We have allowed unscientific rumors to trump scientific dogma and a very bad, dishonest publication about measles, mumps, and rubella being tied to autism has in fact now undermined what has, I believe was the greatest scientific breakthrough in our lives, and that's vaccinations. So as we unravel the craziness of the healthcare system, payment, HIPAA, scientific technology, and put the patient centered first, without latex, but touching each other, without with allowing patients to understand that death and dying is a part of life, to allow patients an exit if they want to. As those in this room have grandchildren and will soon have grandchildren, we have to get this country scientifically back on track and undo the unraveling of science when it comes to immunizations. I believe, and I believe that everybody in this room, or you wouldn't be at this conference, believes that public health means something. And good public health means that we all give a little for the sake of the common good. And if 90% of our population has to be vaccinated in order that we don't see measles, mumps, rubella, outbreaks of whooping cough, and what I fear could be polio lurking right around the corner, then we have a responsibility to take that unraveling and put it back together. We have a lot of work to do, but the work isn't necessarily in the next great invention. It's in talking plain. I grew up in the Midwest. We're meeting here in the Midwest. And one of the things Midwesterners do is we talk plain. We may speak our minds. We may not expect to be part of a popularity contest. We may say things that others don't agree with. But we still, at the end of the day, expect to shake hands, get a beer, or break bread together. But we talk plain. So as we see medicine unravel, I think there's a call on us to remember that the patient is at the epicenter of everything we want and do, whether it's architecture, high tech, or basically what I believe increasingly is the call to be low tech, and that's to touch each other. And we have a responsibility to stop the unraveling of bad science, and increasingly to call on people not to be scientifically illiterate, but to ask our schools to put responsible science back in, to talk about evolution, to talk about science, to talk about reproduction, the difference between love and sex, the responsibility of, of replication, and then how we as human beings take care of ourselves and our neighbors and our communities so that at the end of the day, that unraveling becomes a nat different national tapestry, which is something that I think we can absolutely and should do. Thank you very much. So, uh, are there any other doctors in your family besides, besides you? Um, I'm the third generation, and my, brother's a skull, uh, my brother is a surgeon at the University of Pittsburgh, and he takes brain tumors out through the nose. He's the smart one. Well, but still, your dad has two surgeons in the mm -hmm. family. Now, very poignant scene of you and your dad, and thank God he's, he's doing well. Um, you, you said you whispered to him, if you want to die, it's okay. But you must have, as a surgeon, to a surgeon, have wanted to say to him, should have got the shot. Oh, oh, yells over him. <laughs> Are you kidding? And he, not, not like that, but I, I mean, because I'm, you know, in Minnesota, I'm not even going to, I'm not going to swear today. But yesterday, you know, he was complaining that his forehead hurt. My mother and I looked at him and went, 
Do, don't even ask if we care. <laughs> yeah, you should have gotten the shot. But you know, it's interesting. There is a certain arrogance of being a physician and then suddenly being 80 and 85 and 90, where you think, oh, well, I've lived a great life. What do I need it for? You know why you need it? So you live to be 91, 92, 93, and 94. And there's also an arrogance sometimes that it's like for everybody else, but I'm exempt. But here's what's crazy. It's this weird disconnect that I think sometimes people sort of in the biz do. We never missed a baby shot. Here's a doctor who did tracheotomies on kids with polio in the 60s. He was one of those few doctors who did run into the fire and take care of kids, not knowing if when he came home to see us, was he carrying an infectious disease that might kill his children. But it was that momentary act of arrogance that almost killed him. And I'm sorry for that. However, I have to tell you that through watching gay men die and plan their services as celebrations and being given multiple opportunities to say goodbye to my father, I feel like I've seen death in the most beautiful ways it can be seen. And I honor it as a process. It's made me a better surgeon. Yeah, you don't often hear surgeons step out of the fighting in the sort of boxing arena right. against death metaphor and right. talk about it in the way that you're talking about it there. So that, that certainly is, is a revelation. But there is a legitimate question. Should Medicare pay for a shingle shot? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. There's no, so. <laughs> there are two things the federal government should pay for. Every child should go to school with a full tummy, and every child should have a shot, and every vaccination should be covered for from birth to death, bar none. That is public health. We feed each other, we get our vaccines, so, period. So, in, and I'm, I'm all for that as well. You talked a little bit about the, uh, the autism. Yeah, that you know, bogus sort of, science. The bogus science, right. But there is a tension in the United States. Um, some would say that the impulse to embrace organic food, exclusively unprocessed food, completely back to nature food, comes with it a suspicion of government imposed agents that go into my body. They may not ascribe to the entire sort of autism right. view, but they may have a suspicion of non-natural elements. And we've created this tension in, in the United States today. Sometimes it's anti-intellectual, but sometimes it's a, it's a sort of a suspicion of anything that's not sort of back to the land. But well, you know, it's interesting. And so polio virus is natural. It's great. I mean, if you want to get it, fine, but I don't think the average person does. So if I can give you a shot that could prevent getting polio virus, wouldn't you want that? If I can give you a shot against getting meningitis, or as we get older, uh, in, well, a lot of people don't like their influenza shot. I'm a big believer in that. But pneumococcus, um, wouldn't we want that? So if you can get a medicine that can prevent an illness, isn't that better than having to take a lot of medicines afterwards to treat an illness? I would argue yes. But somehow we've equated immunizations with toxins and the government's making me do it in big bad pharma. We've gotten into the cuckoo track. Time to get back to like Normalville. Does technology and the uh, enlargement of medical institutions contribute to that in the sense that part of the putting on of the latex gloves becomes a, a separation from people and that, that the, the glove is a symbol of how technology is you our You want your metaphor? There's your metaphor. Absolutely. I mean, the glove really is, to me, a metaphor for what's been fractured in this country, that patients don't feel a part of the system, that if you're my doctor, I expect you to not really invite me into your life. You're going to put drop the guard, and yet you're not going to share my medical records with me, but you'll glove, put on a glove and keep me from getting you know, in close proximity to you. We have created artificial barriers where the patients feel excluded from their own data, their own lives, their own determinations. You know, there's an interesting statistic. 70% of people say they want to die at home. 70% of people die in hospitals. So what does that tell us about we as 
people in the medical business that we're not doing. We're not honoring people the way we should. And I don't think, look, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I don't think it's big, bad pharma. I don't think it's big, bad um, government. But I do think we have stopped hearing each other. We've stopped telling each other our stories. And maybe it's because I'm a Midwesterner, but I think when people do sit down and we share our stories, even if we disagree, we always find that we have more in common than we would have ever suspected. And it's the impulse to hold in this sense of individual privacy on the consumer's part. Right. And this kind of liability conscious sense of separation on the medical institution's part which in, in a way is fueling this disconnect. So one of the big disconnects I think is this privacy issue. So this is, this is making me a little cuckoo. Yesterday a guy came up to me, I'm not kidding, at, and this was at the Mayo Clinic, so excited because he wanted to show me the new drone he just built that flies all over your area taking pictures. I said, well, so much for privacy. And at the same time, 22 year olds are posting on Facebook their GYN results. Folks, there's no privacy. So I think the hard thing is our generation trying to figure out what do we own, who gets what, and then we don't even have to get into the whole NSA thing. Well, the, the NSA should just crazy. become a part of the FDA. <laughs> They've got the data, <laughs> yeah. digitize it, put it on an app, but, we're done. But you know they need a better computer system and it's lousy. They definitely do, I yeah. would take the, I, if, I were, if I were running the federal government, I would go hijack the top 20 outlaws in the Silicon Valley, the 18 year olds who don't behave and don't follow rules and say, you're gonna design the federal computer system because it takes someone smarter. No one in DC is smart enough to do it. <laughs> the, the Nancy Snyderman Snowden grant. Yes, yes. yes there, exactly. there we go, there we go. Certainly someone will fund that. <laughs> one, one last question because you have an interesting um, uh, sort of foot in, in a lot of different worlds here. and. Your uh, association with GE, yeah. GE has been a sponsor of this conference and we're really grateful for that. Um, two years ago they were here explaining the design process that went into turning MRI scanners for kids right. into non-scary kind of right. pirate ships and things. It seems to me though that sometimes the solution to disarming technology is less about painting the machines to look like pirate ships and more about just the approach of the doctors so that they don't right. act like, how do you get that message across at GE? Because they're very interested in this high tech, low tech kind right. of thing. Right, so let me explain, you know, GE used to own NBC News, which is why I still um, ha have my fingers in on some of the scientific technology at GE. And I'm part of this movement called Healthy Imagination. My personal belief is that GE has to be willing to cannibalize itself. Because you're right, you can spray paint all the pretty scanners you want, and the reality is there's still multi-million dollar scanners and how many can you sell? But increasingly, smart medicine has to be mobile medicine. It has to be stuff I can hold in the palm of my hand. For the first time ever, medical students at NYU aren't being given stethoscopes this year. They're being given handheld ultrasounds. Because we have to sort of, why are we using something we've used for 200 years when the technology to look inside the body is something just as small? And I think that's gonna be GE's big hurdle. It has to be non-frightening. It has to be something you can share immediately with the patient. We have to be able to send wirelessly messages to Dubai in a nanosecond. And frankly, I saw it after the disaster in Haiti, no one's doing this stuff better than the Israelis because they've been required to. They've, they are, whole entire medical system has adapted to what happens on the battlefield and it's made them smarter. We haven't had to do that. Not yet. Yeah. Thanks Always a so pleasure. Much. So good Always to see you. Take care. Bye, everybody.